everybody, it's me again, Patricia Windrow at the Cable Easel with part two of a study which I began with part one, obviously. And the name of it is now going to be given a more, more acceptable term. It's called the Blydenburg Landfill. What I've called it is a mountain of sludge because I tend to be brutally honest many, many times. But this is a scene which I picked for many reasons, that I wanted to lecture everybody and I wanted to be the boss and I wanted to be the teacher and the great environmentalist today. So I picked a scene which looks like it could be in the far west, but it's actually right here in Hopog. And it is created by guess who? Us. We. The populace uh, are the ones that have managed to produce this thing. Uh, it is right there for anybody to be able to see as they pass Blydenburg Road heading south towards Motor Parkway. So if you are interested in where I go to paint and what the little scenes there that I bring, that's where it is. Here I have begun the composition. I'm now doing the second part, which is the details. The details are, of course, the middle ground, and then I'm going to work forward towards the foreground. And hopefully I will not be really too, uh, too annoying to everybody with what I'm talking about. But actually, I think that it is, uh, it is more than just interesting. It is something that possibly uh, we can begin to think a little bit more, more uh, seriously about than we have so far. I remember, uh, perhaps you remember also, a few years ago there was a thing called the barge. And it, uh, it went from port to port to port and nobody wanted it and it was it was embarrassingly enough Long Island garbage maybe even some of mine and I was really I was really embarrassed when people would say where do you live and I say I live on Long Island and they'd say oh that's where the barge comes from yes that's absolutely right so it became an embarrassment apparently not enough of an embarrassment for things to change because it has gotten just as bad maybe more we still don't know where to put any of the stuff and we can't put it on a barge again because we'll go through that embarrassment once again. So anyway, the recycling thing is what I'm after. And this picking of this mountain of sludge, which is uh, called politely a landfill. Actually, it's a land dump. And uh, it, uh, it's not acceptable behavior. And I'm afraid that we're all going to have to really think very seriously about what to do about it. And uh, maybe the little programs like this and me being a real pain in the neck about it can uh, awaken some people's feelings. Uh, if, you take your, if you take your junk and your stuff and recycle it, it won't land in this place. And maybe in time, this place uh, in, on Blydenburg Road is going to be able to be seeded with beautiful, sweet-smelling grasses that will sway in the breeze and bring birds. By the way, today, you know, when this, play, this scene was shot, uh, we saw four uh, red-winged blackbirds chirping uh, in the trees. Uh, and I also think I saw a yellow bird of some sort, maybe an escaped budgerigar or whatever those little, those little house birds are. But there was a yellow bird. It could have been a canary of some sort. However, uh, the birds have not really found themselves too uh, discombobulated by this. They uh, might be even be finding some nourishment in this place, but not for long because uh, that will all eventually have to come to an end. I do believe that somewhere along the line somebody said uh, that the um the Blydenburg landfill is in fact maybe on its way to being closed forever, which of course is, uh, which is of course what I just said, to plant it with uh, beautiful swaying grasses or maybe even something more glamorous than that, uh, some beautiful things that will be able to uh, bring back the land to its, uh, to its really pristine beauty, which is why we all live here and pay these outrageous taxes. And we pay these outrageous taxes because it's such a pretty place to live and it should be kept that way. Otherwise, all of these thousands and thousands of dollars a year that you're paying in taxes is going to go for a place that won't be livable. Just that simple. It simply will not be livable. And um, uh, so let me go on about, let me go on now uh, for just a moment until I come back and, and bug you some more about this problem. Uh, I'm putting this foreground in, which are the, um, these are what I'm doing right now, the silhouettes of some little trees that have long since died. Uh, well, either through attrition or through the fact that they uh, had a drought or the gypsy moths came, but they nevertheless have just turned into little uh, sort of, uh, 
uh, fence-like uh, posts back here in the right side of the picture, and they are no longer alive. But they do have a nice sort of a brambly quality to them, which I'm going to show you. See all those nice sort of, oh, those are very indistinguishable, but they are brambly. And it's very typical of Long Island in certain places that the brambles are, um, are impenetrable. But they're great fun to paint, especially if you have a brand new brush that I just got from the uh, Scribe Art Shop in Port Jefferson. It cost me $2.52, and you cannot beat it. It is my very favorite kind of thing. It is a, um, it is a synthetic fiber uh, uh, brush called a striping brush. And here it is. Here is this nice, um, you see how fine it is? It's reduced, it's got many, many hairs, but they're very, very small, and they're very close together. And this is, this is the kind of brush that you must have in order to do these, this, this technique. And here, let me, let, let me go to some more of these, um, of these trees that are no longer, no longer with us, but they are still sentinels to what they used to be, and they are, they are wonderful to have the, uh, to be able to practice. First of all, you practice these, these crazy little, uh, um, brambly type of dead branches, and they make for a nice design as well. Uh, it's all part of nature. Uh, the trees are not all the ones that you see on some of the other programs where they're all done with a brush. You go whack, 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 and there's another tree. Six trees in a row because you've hit the canvas six times. It doesn't work. Uh, and so here, let me go over here to this, um, to this one. This has, got, um, this has got the telltale signs of, the, of a tree that is going to pop into bloom. Now, within the next few weeks, if this spring will ever make up its mind to get here, I think that there have been complaints from ever, all over the country that the spring is not only late, but it's also extremely chilly. Uh, however, and that's why these trees are not, um, are not coming forth as quickly as they ought to. However, uh, you know, I could take this painting uh, back uh, in a couple of weeks and simply uh, put what I see in the way of greens if I'm missing a tremendous amount of uh, greenery. Uh, but I really like the, uh, the simplicity of these the sort of Japanese look of trees that haven't got leaves on them yet. I don't know, there's something, something oriental and something very simple and uh, intriguing to me about these, um, about these leafless trees. Now, I've no, I notice here on this one that these, uh, that these branches go up. Uh, once again, I'm using an extremely thin quality of paint here on this, uh, on this very fine brush, and it can give you the, uh, the, the anatomy of this tree. That's what we're after. We're after the anatomy, not just a sort of a, of a, of a kind of an impression of it. We really want to find out what this tree has that makes it look like this. And so this is, a, this is a, my, my ability to, to do these very fine lines is going to give you the details that I find most people like to see. A lot of people don't want to have so much left to the imagination as you find in a lot of paintings these day, days that the things are done just sort of arbitrarily and you're supposed to kind of fill in the blank spaces. Well, I'm going to try and fill in as many blank spaces for you as I possibly can. And um, uh, I think anybody who's taking up painting and wants to learn how to do this, just watch, and then, and then, it's, then, obviously, you practice. Um. Over here, coming from the uh, other side of the uh, of the canvas, is a tree that some is a sort of a vine that seems to be cr crawling downwards, and it's uh, it uh, goes behind this one. That's why uh, that's why I waited until uh, afterwards until that tree was in so that I could put this uh, this vine, which and, and and there's nothing but vines over in this particular area because the place is totally neglected. You know, the interesting thing to me is that in in places like uh, let's say countries that are very small and that have, uh, have not got the enormous room that we have. We have so much room that we think that we can waste room. And by wasting room, I mean that a place such as this, which is neglected, there is trash, there, is, there are tires, there are paper cups, there are uh, horrid wire things uh, that are just sort of willy-nilly lying there because we have room. We don't seem to care that this one particular space is no longer as beautiful as it might be. And that's why uh, there is a lesson to be learned about living in a place that's maybe small and that you have to make every inch work for you. Uh, that happens in Japan. It also happens in places like Italy. In Italy, there is not one area of the road that doesn't have a grapevine growing on it. Uh, and, and, and of course, out of that comes the, the fabulous wines. But um, uh, space is, uh, is used to tremendous advantage in places that don't have much of it. And and um, just because we've got all the space doesn't mean that we can leave a little side corner of this road here uh, totally abandoned. I don't know why anybody couldn't possibly just go and pick up this trash sometimes, especially that it's across the street from people who live there. And I must say that um, 
and not wanting to sound like a uh, like a real weirdo or somebody who has lost her mind, but I certainly would go and pick up the trash across the way there. If it was across from my driveway, believe me, I would pick up that trash. I would not go out of my driveway every day and see that. So, uh, and of course, I've done it for years myself in Setauket. I have cleaned up wherever I can. All right, now here comes this foreground, which is still sort of this mauveish tone here. This is still kind of wintry. There is not much going on. There is a very brave clump of grass that is growing here uh, in the foreground. But for the most part, this is still the remnants of a winter of uh, fallen leaves, um, uh, you know, uh, things that have died and uh, rotten places and so on. And this is all what this foreground is. However, what makes it fascinating is that I can throw a shadow from these trees in and you will now be convinced that there is the brilliant sun outside. Just the, even though I've got a light tone on the side of this tree here, I'm going to show you what happens when you simply introduce a, um, a good strong shadow that comes from a good strong sun, which is what there was on the day that uh, this was um, photographed. Now here we go. Uh, this uh, this shadow is going to is going to anchor that tree. I'm using some I'm using some dark tones of uh, uh, there. Now see that tree is nicely anchored. It is vital, uh, and and I wish that the other programs would pay attention to these things because there are a lot of people who don't see my show. They see the other ones, and the other ones are not giving all the giving all the word like it should. Uh, and here, this one, this tree is apparently not throwing much of a shadow. It seems to be going behind this one and uh, into the distance. But it still has, it still has a little bit of an anchor. So all of these things are very important, in my opinion, to make these uh, realistic paintings. Uh, here, there is, there seems to be a, uh, a great dark area, and I, as I recall, it is a fallen log uh, that, of course, has long since died, and it is now sort of, uh, sort of, well, it's turning grayish, uh, it's turning a grayish nothing color. And I'm going to try to interpret it. If I could go back there and get a better detail of it, but I think that I'm going to have to just settle on my on my knowledge of what happens to old trees when they when they fall down because the um, the monitor is not picking up to, uh, enough information for me to be able to be absolutely true to what that is like. But as I recall, it was a. Um, it was probably one of these great, wonderful old things that uh, simply succumbed, either through age, or neglect, or a hurricane, maybe. We've had a few of those, and uh, things have fallen, and even though they fell a long time ago, they have not yet been picked up. So here, uh, let us say that uh, for argument's sake, this is in fact the floor of the forest, uh, or this little area. It's not a forest, believe me. If it were, it would be wonderful. It's, it is a little side place off the road that is terribly in need of some help. Uh, so, uh, there is a, here is a composition with an awful lot of darkness. Uh, I'm going to put some more, I'm going to put some more darkness in right now. I'm going to mix it up with my palette knife. I'm going to use some of this Venetian red, a touch of this uh, ultramarine blue, and see if I can get the darkness, uh, maybe a little bit of yellow ochre, here in the foreground, because the last part of the program is going to be devoted to doing the brambles, the um, bushes, and this very brave and uh, lovely little forsythia uh, bush uh, that is uh, 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 somehow managing to uh, put forth some uh, bright yellow. It's, it's a little bit like the, uh, the recession. Uh, the recession is dark and dreary and full of horrid places, and then all of a sudden something happens and uh, the bright yellow comes out and um, one feels better immediately. Let's hope that uh, the uh, forsythia bush in my painting is symbolic of what is happening possibly to the economy of this country. We've had enough of seeing people uh, really having a very, very hard time of it. Uh, I'm absolutely appalled that, uh, that this government <laughs> has permitted such devastation to take place to very nice people, namely us Americans. Uh, we, uh, a lot of us are less nice, but most, for the most part, we're hardworking, good people, and uh, the last uh, few years have been extremely difficult, uh, which I find um, 
well, not not easy for me to dismiss. Not easy for me to not think about. I I do think about it uh, on a daily basis. And so um, before uh, anything um, more comes out of me in the way of political feelings, which I should not probably do because this is art. We want to play with art and paintings and places. Um, I'm going to come back in a few minutes. Don't go away, and I maybe will promise to not do this again. <laughs> I'll be back. Here we are back again to wind up this program, which is a study of an outside scene, as usual, in our viewing area. And um, if you've been watching, you know where it is. And I think that the wind up is going to be the great fun part, which means that um, I'm going to figure out how to make that for Scythia Bush. Now, if, I, if, if it works, then it's great. If it doesn't work, well, then I'll have to apologize publicly, which I'm not, I'm not loath to do that. And here we go. I'm going to show you. I'm putting the shadow in of first of this clump of grass. And the clump of grass uh, is, is very important because the rest of the painting is what us painters call a monochromatic picture, meaning that there are very few colors in it. Uh, so the opportunity to, to change that is here by putting this, um, this clump of grass that's in the foreground. I'm using some pretty pure uh, color here. It's uh, called yellow-green, comes right out of the tube. And many times I hesitate to use greens that come out of the tube. The yellow green that I have found, this is a new discovery of mine, I'm finding myself uh, uh, willing to use it. So uh, here I'm going to show you that this clump of grass is going to give a whole interesting um, uh, feeling to this, to this uh, otherwise quite limited palette uh, painting. Uh, it, um, the introduction of the green is, uh, I think, vital for the, uh, for the general appeal of any painting. You, you, you have to, you have to have, you, you ought to have, you don't have to have, there are no rules, but you ought to have uh, the interest of, um, of, an, of another introduction of a color uh, somewhere along the line. And if you can do it with, um, if you can do it with something as small as a leaf, as a, as a uh, blade of grass, then uh, that makes for the, for the mystery as well. Uh, the, uh, even something as small as grass picks up the highlights of the sun. And uh, there is one or two, if you can get a, if, if a, a close-up of this, will show you that those little, those little uh, uh, strokes of uh, grass are uh, telling you that the, uh, there is sun out there. There we are. And um, they, uh, they are uh, es essential to tell the story of what this is. Now, here is, the, um, here is the, um, that great uh, shadow down, down by, the, uh, by the grass, and it sort of falls into the, uh, into the lower part of the grass, and it all becomes one. And this is what we call the mystery of, of light and shade. When this, uh, when this clump of grass uh, blends its lower dark part into the shadow, uh, it's what is called a painterly approach to painting. Uh, this 
this is uh, this is really absolutely vital uh, understanding that this area right here and the shadow are one and the same and they are not separated. Something that I haven't talked about before, but it's rather fun to talk about it now. I'm going to use my trusty finger to uh, to blend this off and to get rid of, of the harshness of it because it should be actually quite soft and, and it should sort of disappear. And you can, but remember, don't eat when you paint because there's poison in paint and if you get it on your fingers then, well, then you've got yourself a problem. All right comes the forsythia, the moment of fun, the fun moment. Hopefully I can, I can pull it off. I'm not sure that this kind of thing always works. I have to reduce this paint uh, down to a, uh, a viable, workable consistency um, to make it so that it will, uh, so that it'll do what I want it to do. Paint sometimes is very resisting. It does not stick where you want it to. And I'm going to use the palette knife. There's a wonderful close-up of it. Well, the best that I can hope for is to interpret what I see with, uh, with a palette knife and I believe that uh, if I keep it simple it will be uh, it'll be comprehensible to um, to uh, the viewers of this that uh, something is growing that is brilliant in, in in yellow tones in the uh, in the foreground of this picture the um, the application of this of this paint uh, with my palette knife I find is the uh, is the most uh, is the most effective way to do this at this time because my canvas is extremely wet and uh, I cannot possibly put um put a brush to this canvas, it'll pick up the wet paint. However, I do see that there are branches uh, that come out and they're rather pale. The sun is catching them and they're rather pale. And let me just, uh, let me just point out how I'm going to show you the, the direction of this plant. Uh, this little forsythia has got three Three, three directions. Uh, it's actually sort of triangular. One goes up and the other one come and they come down and then another one goes off to the side. And that's the general direction of these blossoms. So uh, here we go. Uh, I'm putting it on very thick. It'll take a while for this to dry. But uh, the thickness of the of paint is always intriguing to, be, intriguing to people and especially to me. I love to see the texture uh, of, of, of heavy paint uh, on, on an oil painting. I, I find that it's, uh, it's, the, it's the reason for, the pa for oil painting, to have a nice, heavy, and generous texture of color. Uh, I'm putting all the pale yellows on. I'm going to introduce also some of the um, uh, yellow ochre because some of those branches, some of those flowers, flowers are in shadow. And you'll see that the shadow of this will work uh, also but rather well. They're not all brilliant yellow because they do fall into shadow. Uh, I think that when we step back and see that this is, uh, this is a technique of how to do this bush, um, uh, you can do other ones in exactly the same way and they're all out now. I don't think I have ever seen the Forsythia on Long Island as amazing as it is this year. I have just come up from, uh, from Virginia and I find that um, uh, rarely have I seen such a remarkable display. I don't know what happened this winter, but the forsythia trees certainly liked it. There is a uh, there is a difference this year than there was last year. It is really absolutely astonishing. So here is a way to put the forsythia trees in the forsythia bushes and by golly if you're wanting for looking for something to paint go on out and find some of them the bands of yellow that are that are uh, flanking the road in many many places all over the island is absolutely amazing uh, you'll find that um, you'll find that uh, maybe even your own backyard there's a study for you to do out there uh, be observant see that some of them are being caught by the sun this painting will of course be available for sale in the Art for Open Lands, which has been now uh, uh, postponed and advanced to uh, the month of June. Uh, announcements were made um, uh, this winter that we were going to have the Art for Open Lands sale in the end of May, but uh, we were not able to get every uh, detail ironed out in order to pull this pull this off so uh, with your indulgence we're going to um, we're going to put it on in June which may be even a nicer time of year to do it than in um, than in May uh, so um, this painting will be uh, available it'll be framed and available for sale at that time 
uh, I think that it might be a conversation piece for some people if they want to come and uh, if they want to come and look at it. Uh, the paintings are going to be reasonably priced. They uh, none of them is over three hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, and I think that anybody who came to the Art for Open Lands the last time will know that uh, whoever bought a painting probably got themselves a good buy. Uh, especially that a lot of it is uh, deductible. You it goes to the Nature Conservancy to buy more lands on Long Island so that we can save this this nifty band of earth that sticks out into the Atlantic Ocean and has so many wonderful places on it. Well, uh, as, I, as, I, as I dab away, and I'm going to put the uh, shadow of this Forsythia bush um, right here in front of your very eyes as the program is going to come to an end very soon. But here we must anchor this bush, and this bush is um, uh, the 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 uh, yellow uh, leaves are are much too brilliant to become as dark as a shadow as the grass was, but uh, there is nevertheless a different pattern to this shadow as there was to the grass. This is actually probably um, sh giving me the shadows of the of the uh, hundreds of little. Um, uh, flowers. So the shadow of this uh, of this um, Forsythia uh, bush is uh, d has got a little a little uh, anatomy all its own. So the last few details that probably could be done would be the few things that may be lying in the foreground: branches, uh, um, uh, twigs, things that shine in the sun, things that are um, maybe darker than others. Let me see if I can come up with some pretty terrific looking twigs and branches and things like that because you have to reduce these scenes down to some comprehensible uh, level, but they are all nevertheless very wiggly and sharp, sharp edged. Sometimes they, uh, they send out, uh, sometimes they send out very uh, wonderful looking shapes and so on, but this all very little wild stuff here has to be designated and shown just like what it is. And there we have uh, a sort of a, a sort of a faithful study of a place right here on Blydenburg Road in Hopog. It's the landfill sludge heap. <laughs> I am perverse, aren't I? But uh, nevertheless, I think we've had uh, some rather fun doing this. I hope that you've enjoyed it. I hope that uh, I hope that I didn't um, sound too much like a, an old pill. But I do feel that uh, if you have any questions or if you have any remarks to make, by all means, write to me. There's no point in, uh, in not writing if you have some feelings about what I've been talking about. Well, this is me. Patricia Windrow, don't forget to tune in on the last Tuesday of every month. I'm going to be live at that time. So until I see you the next time, or until you see me the next time, this is me at the Cable Easel, wishing you bye-bye and thanks for watching.